great honour to welcome you all um, and introduce you to this first uh, annual Bruce Winnell Memorial Lecture. Um, it's going to be given by uh, William Dalrymple and he's going to be in conversation with Dr Indrajit Roy. It's so wonderful to see so many old friends of Bruce here today, but for those of you who don't know him, I'll just give you a few words. He was a traveller, linguist, scholar and musician, but above all he was a kind and generous friend and a person who loved nothing more than to bring people together and to stimulate discussion on a wide range of topics, but especially anything related to India, Afghanistan, or the wider Persianate world. When he was not traveling in far-flung lands, he lived here in York for over 20 years until his death in 2020, and that's why this annual lecture series is based here in York. As a longtime friend and someone who traveled and worked with Bruce over the course of many, many years, it's wonderful that William was uh, able to come and give this lecture. And we're indebted to Sarah Mitchell and the York Festival Ideas team, who have done a fantastic job to put this event on and set the bar very high for the future. In order to perpetuate his memory and continue his legacy of bringing people together, a fund to support the cost of future lectures has been set up, and it's been held in trust by the British Institute of Persian Studies. There's been a lot of very generous donations, and anyone who would like to donate can either contact me or the British Institute of Persian Studies through the email on their website. Now, I know better than to think any of you have come here to listen to me talk, so with that, I'll hand over to our speakers, and thank you all for coming for what promises to be a fascinating discussion. Okay, so I am delighted to be able to introduce our speaker, William Dalrymple, uh, the best-selling author, um, the Wolfson Prize-winning White Mughals, uh, The Last Mughal, which won the Duff Cooper Prize, uh, the Hemingway and Kapuczynski Prize-winning Return of a King, so that's three books, uh, and the fourth, his most recent, is The Anarchy, uh, which was long-listed for the Bailey Gifford Prize of 2019, uh, shortlisted for the Duke of Wellington Medal for Military History, for the Tata Book of the Year Nonfiction Award, the Historical Writers Award of uh, 2020, the finalist for the Kurdil Book Prize for History, and, the 20, and it won the 2020 Arthur Ross Medal for, from the U, uh, US Center for Council for Foreign Relations. Really, William. Well, a selection of these books will be uh, available to buy from our independent bookseller, Fox Allen Books, uh, outside. And uh, for those of you who are interested, William will also be signing uh, some of the copies, I think. Um, he's been awarded five honorary doctorates. Um, he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, the Royal Asiatic Society, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, uh, he's held visiting fellowships from at Princeton, Brown, and in Oxford. He writes regularly for the New York Review of Books, uh, The New Yorker, and The Guardian, and has been presented with the prestigious British Academy's um, President's Medal in 2020, named one of the top 50 uh, intellectuals uh, for 2020 by Prospect Magazine, and the founder and co-director of the Jaipur Literature Festival which has been billed as the largest or greatest literary event on earth, I think. <laughs> okay, so he's joining us this afternoon to talk about his amazing career. Uh, he'll kick off with a small talk, I think, and then we'll have uh, a, a short conversation uh, followed by uh, con questions, comments, thoughts that uh, you, our audience members, might have. William, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. These are the four books all in their nice slip jacket, and um, this is the man who really enabled all of it. And I can hear from that uh, chair in the audience that I think this room is probably full of Bruce's friends, uh, all of whom I'm sure miss him as much as I do. He was a completely unique character, quite unlike anyone else I've ever met. Um, as Indrajita said, a scholar, a traveler, uh, a, a wonderful friend, a cook, a musician, um, a, 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 an apparator of Persian musicians from nowhere, um, a, a, house, a house guest who never left uh, uh, serially over a period of 20 years, a, uh, but a joyous presence. There was some incredibly irritating reviews of uh, the book which Barnaby Rogerson 
um, put together uh, of memoirs of Bruce that described him as uh, as a sort of um, uh, almost like a sort of parasite, which is the opposite was true. Bruce was someone who enriched any room he ever walked into, and uh, suddenly uh, you know the room would be sort of strung with sort of strange hangings from Qatar, and uh, uh, a, a hanging garden of pot plants would appear, uh, a harps baroque harpsichord would be erected in one corner, uh, and uh, suddenly a sort of 10 Persian musicians would start singing guzzles in another corner. And uh, he just had this ability to, to, to turn the mundane into the extraordinary. Uh, and all our lives, I think, are, are, d are diminished uh, by, his, uh, by his absence. This picture here is the last time I saw him just, um, he'd been the night before to a preview of um, the show or company school paintings, Forgotten Masters, which uh, he'd been an incredible help with. And in the course of this final lunch, he recited fr perfectly from heart uh, a guzzle of Hafez, which he then translated, um, the night is dark, I am afraid of the waves. This savage whirlpool terrifies me. You who walk on the distant shore, light burdened, what do you know of my inner state? Uh, and it was, I think, you know, he felt, as much as we all did, the terrible injustice that this life should be cut off so young. Uh, and it's a great honour and pleasure to, to have the uh, honour of remembering him here today. Thank you uh, for this. And thank you, Lisa, um, wherever you are, um, for organising it, and, and Bruce and all the very other people who have uh, contributed to this actually happening. And I hope it'll become a, a, a much-loved annual event in the calendar. Um, just a few pictures of Bruce uh, to start with. This is Bruce, uh, sort of uh, fantastically sort of cravatted, uh, halfway up some monument in Afghanistan. Um, when I was in Herat, where this picture was taken, I met various people that had met Bruce at the height of the Afghan Civil War. Um, and he had, he, he, he'd come with the Mujahideen on horseback across Afghanistan, like some sort of 19, uh, uh, sort of 20s or possibly a sort of 18, uh, 20s or possibly 1780s traveler. Um, and uh, halfway through um, uh, whatever he was up to then, uh, he'd heard that there was some early guzzles of some Persian poet I'd never heard of uh, inscribed on a wall of some mosque in the... Soviet side, and he crossed over the border on a donkey and disappeared for two weeks. They all assumed he'd been captured and tortured. He ambled back two weeks later, <laughs> very happy, having transcribed this and wrote some uh, some obscure scholarly paper on these early guzzles, which appeared and, and, and delighted his his friends. Um, and this was him at the very end. Um, he had a nice job from the Aga Khan, writing down all the. Uh, inscribing all the tombstones uh, in, in um, the Gazagar and Kabul. Um, and ne he was never happier than when working uh, on these um, uh, extraordinary inscriptions. I'm quickly going to just run through the work we did together over 20 years, because one of the extraordinary things about Bruce was though he was a, a, a man of enormous learning uh, in a huge variety of topics. And... Um, has helped um, an enormous number of people uh, with their research. He produced an oddly slim um, bibliography himself. He, was, uh, he, he didn't really enjoy writing, and he, he found it difficult. And, and I was the lucky recipient of, of much of his learning. And these four books, the Company Quartet, which we did together over 20 years between... 1999 and 2019, and it was published just, I think, two weeks before he got his diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, um, contains so much that was you know, completely unobtainable from other sources. Most obviously, Bruce was a superb translator of Mughal Persian. And Mughal Persian is a, is, is a sort of, uh, I mean, I, I, uh, it's been reinforced since his absence of how very few people can actually read this uh, uh, clearly and translate it lucidly. Um, India, from the 12th century onwards, became part of the Persianate world. And just like France was used in Tolstoy and Russia as a diplomatic court language, so Persian was for 600 years of Indian history. And today, 
there are only a handful of scholars that can read it. And, and, as, and, and the more that I, I send stuff around to people to translate, the more you realize that even they sort of stumble over shorthand or, 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 or scribal ticks that, uh, that Bruce seemed to be able to take in his stride and, and understand and, and, and translate with great, great ease. And we would go to li obscure libraries in Tonk or Patna or uh, the British Library here uh, or uh, the Na National Archives in Delhi. And Bruce would we'd photocopy these things, eventually end up back home with a nice sheaf of, of, of copies. And Bruce would read it as fluently as if it was the front page of the Times um, and, and give wonderful, superb translations in his gorgeous prose. Um, and uh, it's a skill which amazingly few people have. It's, it, it's, a, it's a lost art. And the more that India moves away from its Persianate past and its Islamic history, uh, the more that loss uh, needs to be uh, can be felt. Because, in a sense, the... The thing that distinguishes these four books, I think, is Bruce's translations. The fact that they, there's huge seams of work um, uh, which Bruce produced from a rich variety of Persian language sources over four books, um, which um, it had, has, most of which had simply never, ever been translated into English before. And it's difficult to think of another field uh, uh, in history way, where one could stumble on whole libraries of untranslated manuscripts that no one simply bothered to look at. Um, and it's much easier to do a sort of uh, post-colonial thesis uh, um, analysing uh, Orientalism in travel writing or something that just involves getting books out of the library and, and sort of applying a bit of Said to it. The real hard work of the, of the, uh, uh, of the rock face of, of, of going in and translating these... these, these very complex sources and, and uh, working out what's, what's uh, useful and, uh, and what isn't um, is, is something that Bruce excelled in, uh, and, and it is a, a massive loss. Just to run very, very quickly through some pictures and the books prior to, um, uh, prior to uh, uh, talking to Indrajit, just to have a quick canter. The first book we worked together uh, was called White Mughals, it involved a lot of sources from Hyderabad, which is uh, at that now the Deccan is receiving a lot of attention from uh, from scholars. But at that period, 20 years ago, there'd been remarkably little work on any period of the Deccan history, and very, very little on uh, uh, early 19th century Deccan and Hyderabad, which was the last sort of stranded fragment of the Mughal Empire sitting uh, on its own uh, 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 in the middle of the Deccan, and it was the story of of a um, Persian princess uh, who brought up in India uh, who fell in love with a man called James Achilles Kirkpatrick. Um, if we can wind forward to him. Uh, we've got lots of pictures of all these characters. Hang on, we have to, here we are. Here is James Kirkpatrick. And uh, the two, um, the two, well, certainly Karanisa got pregnant uh, and then the, uh, uh, the, the, the vizier at the court began to blackmail Kirkpatrick, uh, using this knowledge. And there was a spectacular source, uh, which had never been used before, called the Tufatul Alam by Karanisa's uncle, uh, who was called Abdul Latif Shushtri. Uh, and uh, the first time I ever contacted Bruce to work together was to translate this, this document I'd found in Hyderabad. Uh, and it turned out to be a very juicy source. Abdul Latif Shushtri was a sort of 18th century Persian versus a version of V.S. Naipaul who huffed and puffed and complained about everything Indian um, and wrote sort of fantastically clear and precise prose about the many reasons he didn't like the country he was writing about. Uh, and um, we had great fun doing this book together, the extraordinary story of this forgotten world uh, of uh, British men who shed their skin, their, 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 their skin in many ways, and um, took on the ways of India. People like... Uh, William Fraser, seen here, drawn by, uh, painted by Rayburn in Edinburgh before he set out to India. On arrival, you can see he's, he's, he's still got his Scottish hat on, but everything else south of there is uh, beginning to transform. And he's, here he is with his, his Persian calligraphy pens and his, uh, uh, and his, his uh, Mughal jama. Uh, and as he goes on, he gets more, his beard grows longer, and uh, uh, he, he, uh, he, he's kind of more and more lost to, his, to this other world, which he found enormously attractive. And, uh, and then again, this was a world which Bruce intuitively uh, understood and, uh, and felt for, because he had uh, been entirely seduced by the Persian world and, uh, and all that it 
uh, represented to him. Uh, and as well as just translating these documents, Bruce guided me um, to the, through the etiquette of Persian court language and, uh, and in a whole variety of ways was a sort of tutor and educator. He was also a very severe critic. Uh, and, uh, and, and a, a whole different side of his character would emerge when you gave him a bit of manuscript to comment on. And uh, very, very sort of uh, snarly comments would appear in your margins. <laughs> uh, but they were very useful, of course. I mean, this was pre-publication, thank God. I never, he luckily never got to review any of my books after that. <laughs> um, Anyway, from, from the, the next book, this is, uh, this is all, all Karenisa and Kirkpatrick. Just Gallup. This is the extraordinary residency in Hyderabad, now uh, restored, thanks partly to uh, a million-pound check uh, read by one reader of White Moguls, uh, which was given to the uh, World Monuments Fund. Again, you know, none of this would have been possible without Bruce's uh, enormous help. And this is in the garden of the residency, Karenisa's extraordinary Harang Mahal, which was uh, alongside this perfect Palladian villa, um, you get the, the, the perfect Mughal pleasure palace where Karanisa lived uh, amid fountains and parterres and, and gorgeous gardens. Uh, and this was also falling apart. And this was Karanisa's uncle who, who uh, tried to arrange for her exile and, uh, in the mid the scandal that broke out, Mir Alam. Uh, anyway, and, and these are the, the children born of this marriage. But after that, we went on to the last Mughal. Uh, there's a whole extraordinary archive sitting in the National Archive in, uh, in Delhi of uh, uh, the mutiny papers, which are basically the papers gathered by the victorious British after what we call the Indian Mutiny, what's known in India as the First War of Independence. And they were used to hang and prosecute people who had been involved in any way in the uprising, the largest anti-colonial uprising uh, uh, in the 19th century. And Miraculously, these papers had kind of never been used, except by a few Urdu scholars at Aligarh who'd written uh, in, in Urdu and Persian about them. But in English, they were completely virgin. And they, it is a, you know, an invaluable record in Urdu and Persian uh, of the largest anti-colonial uh, revolt in history. Uh, and, and Bruce uh, and another scholar called Mehmood Faruqi went to work, Mehmood working on the Urdu, Bruce working on the Persian. And the last Mughal uh, was the result, the, sto the story of Bahadur Shah Zafar, seen here, who was a wonderful calligrapher, coming right at the end of, uh, of the Mughal period, but um, who, although he'd been shorn of all money, of all resources, nevertheless catalyzed the last great um, flourishing of Mughal letters. And, and the age of Zafar, the age of Ghalib, uh, the age of Zork is to Urdu poetry what the age of Elizabeth is to, uh, and Shakespeare is to the English um, sonnet or the, or the, or, or the uh, Elizabethan stage. Um, and again, just to go to hurl through, these are Zafar's notebooks. Even if you can't read the Urdu, you can see the extraordinary uh, sort of poetic imagination, couplet after couplet tumbling off the page and every, uh, like, these little tiny moleskin notebooks he would use. Um, and then it all resulted in, in the great uprising and all the killings that followed. After that, we set to work on um, a, a, the, a book called Return of the King, which was set in Afghanistan uh, and was the story of the um, 1839 to 42 First Afghan War, the, famously the most sort of uh, tragic and ill-conceived imperial adventure of all times when the East India Company thought it would conquer Afghanistan with the greatest of eaves. And of course, they famously ended in the retreat from Kabul of 1842, when, at least according to legend, only one man stumbled into Jalalabad, Dr. Bryden, on his horse. What was, again, fascinating was that there were spectacular Afghan sources for this, which had simply never been used. Everyone had always repeated the same old uh, English sources, which had been um, uh, worked on beautifully, most, uh, in most popular form uh, by Peter Hopkirk, who turned them into a whole series of, of, of best-selling stories. Um, but the Afghan uh, narratives include biographies, memoirs, uh, and entire epic poems where all the British characters were these sort of devious, uh, including Alexander Burns, who's often still written as a very sort of sympathetic character, but in Afghanistan is regarded as sort of Beelzebub, Shaitan, and uh, every other uh, conceivable demon uh, combined. And um, we got these uh, documents in one day in Kabul as directed to a, a wonderful bookshop in Jawi Shir uh, by uh, the then head of the uh, 
uh, Chancellor of Kabul University, one Ashraf Ghani, who then, went, of course, went on to be president and then fled the country to Dubai in ignominy last year. But we found in one day, literally the most successful day of research in my entire life, um, thanks to Ashraf, this, this wonderful bookseller who had just bought up all the princely libraries of Afghanistan in the 1970s when people began to emigrate, or in the 1980s, and was wi willingly sold the whole lot. So we worked on these for five years, and the result was this extraordinary book that gave an entirely new spin to a very familiar story uh, of imperial hubris with Alexander Burns, Shah Shuja, who looks a bit like sort of Gimli from Lord of the Rings here, but is actually the descendant of Timur. And the story of this great army uh, of Indian mercenaries, the sepoys, heading up uh, under East India Company leadership it, through the Bolan Pass into Afghanistan, where they successfully uh, managed to install um, Shah Shuja uh, on the throne. But of course, it ends in terrible hubris. What was quite amusing about all, all this is that it came out just as the whole thing was beginning to fall apart again in the, uh, uh, it, it just, uh, in the run up to the final humiliation last summer. And we all got called to, Karzai to, uh, to Afghanistan to brief President Karzai, who wanted to know, because he was from the same, uh, not only the same clan, but the same um, tiny sub-clan as Shah Shuja, and saw history repeating. So we came to this deal whereby um, I would come during Ramadan and would sort of, like Shahrazad, entertain him in the evening after his iftar. Uh, and uh, he would then give me an interview for an hour in return. Uh, so we came to this deal. And then... Um, he decided that, that he didn't want to suffer the fate of Shah Shuja and immediately changed his policy towards America. And a whole series of, of uh, telegrams, unknown to us at the time, began shooting backwards and forwards between the State Department and Hillary Clinton. Um, uh, because why has, Shah, why has Shah Karzai changed his policy? Uh, and they identified Return of the King as the reason. And this all then got leaked in WikiLeaks and turned up on the front page of the New York Times. Um, uh, so uh, an unexpected boost to sales in America for, uh, for, uh, for this book, but courtesy of Mr. Putin, uh, not a man who's, who's been working on my sales otherwise, I think. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Anyway, we had, a, we had an extraordinary time, and, and Bruce got to meet Karzai and go into the Arg, and a rather different uh, world to the one he'd been inhabiting in villages and, 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 the, uh, and strange parts of Afghanistan on his donkey in the 1980s. Um, and then finally, the anarchy, the most recent one. Uh, uh, again, this time using mainly documents from the, the Red Fort Library, which is sitting uh, not even catalogued uh, properly in the... Um, in the British Library, and um, we would often emerge with photocopies after months of negotiations, uh, and Bruce would set to work. One occasion, it had been so completely miscatalogued, it turned out to be a story about Shah Jahan period, but when Bruce got his sort of uh, teeth into a text, it was very difficult to extract him, even though it was quite clear this was 200 years before the period we were actually writing about. And then he found some passage about some lion that raped a sadhu and there was some terrible ejaculation that went all over the sadhu. And Bruce got so excited by this, he wouldn't stop. And we lost an entire season of work. Uh, Bruce thought this was some great lost text, none of, none of which, not a word of which ever appeared in this book, of course. And he said he was a bit like the Queen Mary. It took weeks to turn him round once. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, in the end, we'd got some extraordinary, and I think the translations he did for this book are, are some of the most magnificent. Um, it'd be very nice if we could all produce one day a, a, a book of Bruce's translations. I've got them all stacked away, because they are the only, the only translations of so many of these sources. Uh, anyway, in this case, the story of the founding of the East India Company, going back, in a sense, to the beginning of the story, and um, uh, the story of uh, the East India Company. Here is the East India Company headquarters. It is a corporation. It is occupied, uh, came out of an office only five windows wide, set back slightly from the street, tiny little office. Yet from that building, the conquest of the richest country in the world was masterminded by a staff in England, a century into the, into the East India Company's history, only 35 employees in the head office. And in India at the time of Plassey, only 250 white men. Uh, yet they used their networks with the Jain and Mawari bankers to borrow money and built up an army of 200,000 sepoys, which was twice the size of the British Army, uh, but answerable not to Downing Street, not to the Foreign Office, not to the British Army, but instead to this corporation operating out of this tiny office in Leadenhall Street. It's one of the most bizarre stories in history. Uh, and um, Bruce's extraordinary translations from... Uh, the Persian, illuminated this uh, absolutely uh, brilliantly. There's um, one particular source um, 
which had actually already been translated, but was just illustrating how good these are. This was Ghulam Hussein Khan's Ser Mutakarin, which is writing about colonialism just as it's beginning, in very much the same mode as Edward Said wrote in the 1970s. Uh, but while Said was looking back on colonialism from the 70s uh, and seeing how it had, what it had done to uh, indigenous cultures and the loss of, uh, 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 the loss of confidence that it produced, Gomez Saint Khan was writing it in the 1780s, just as it was beginning. And he was noting the way that, for example, that once the British were in charge, there was no longer any work for people, architects who built in the Mughal style, uh, carpenters who, who produced uh, Indian woodwork, uh, painters who produced Indian miniatures that were not prepared to change their tune to write for the, to paint for the new masters. Uh, and this extraordinary look at how uh, the culture of India was warped and, and, and so many uh, great traditions died uh, as a result of this monstrous corporation. Um, and um, maybe we'll leave the end of talk about the company to discussion with Indrajit and, and, and hand over to him now. But this was our last great collaboration. Say Bruce lived to see that came to the publication party uh, as ever the last to leave the party. <laughs> and... Um, and two weeks later, said he was going in to get his results from the NHS, and uh, his 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 decline was horribly quick. Uh, this was, I suppose, uh, November, and he was dead by February. Uh, and in four months, um, this amazing, wonderful, talented life was extinguished. But how wonderful that we have a lecture at least to remember him each year. Thank you. Thank you so much, William. Thank you. Thanks. Very touching. But it does sort of, I, can, I think everyone here will really want to hear how you and Bruce got together in the first place. I mean, we, I think we, we'd like to hear the, 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 the juicy bits. If I, uh, I can, I've, there's, there's lots of juicy bits. <laughs> well, yes, at your discretion. <laughs> um, so I first met Bruce in Islamabad. I had a cousin um, who was was well, supposedly working for the FAO, but I, I, I have my suspicions that other things were going on as well. And he and Bruce um, struck up a friendship because um, my cousin had a, had a piano. And mm. one, the one thing that Bruce mm. would always commandeer wherever he was was, was a, a, a grand piano. I mean, I've, over the years, I've seen Bruce befriend the most unlikely people. Most recently, I mean, in the end, there was this extraordinary American diplomat in Delhi who was a, I think, again, was probably linked somehow to intelligence oh, services. Okay. And, um, but he, at this stage, he was, in his career, he was the number two in the American embassy mm. in, uh, in, in Delhi. And he had this extraordinary Kazakh bodybuilder wife and a grand piano because he was a, he was a uh, Shostakovich fan. He mm. was somewhere from the American Midwest and had been passionate about mm. um, Shostakovich. And this had led him to study Russian, and, sent, and his, his career got diverted. And Bruce met him at some party. And then and, and we ended up sort of spending a lot of time with the bodybuilder. <laughs> 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 Playing, as Bruce and he played, uh, sort of competitive duets on the... Um, on the piano. Again, the competition was an important part of Bruce's piano playing. One of the most wonderful uh, mm. essays in this book, which I strongly recommend to you, uh, of Bruce's memoirs, is, is this wonderful description of, of, of Bruce sort of edging other people off the piano as, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with his piano playing. Great. Um, and tell us about how you sort of got drawn into this world, you know, the, the world of Asia, of South Asia, and, you know, what, which eventually led to this collaboration. But what inspired it, it, you? Entirely back soon. I had an entirely Scottish childhood. I went to mm. school near here. I, I used to come to York Station from the age of eight for ten years and then go up to Ampleforth in the North Yorkshire Moors, now mm. clouded in controversy and scandal, but uh, in those days uh, uh, considered a, a great uh, shining example of Catholic education. Mm. And uh, I, had, I had, was very happy there for 10 years and always wanted to become an archaeologist. I mm -hmm. planned to go to Iraq and the thing fell through at the last minute and ended up with a friend in India. But once there, I discovered that I had not only had uh, generations of my family, because um, mm -hmm. I kept bumping into sort of um, uh, street names and other things which, which I knew were connected with various bits of my family. Um, and... In fact, there have been 10 generations of my family born, died, worked in India uh, for the company and the Raj. Mm. 
Uh, and indeed, I had both Mughal and, and Hindu Bengali blood from Chandanagar, neither of which I was aware of, uh, but which emerged in the course of, of, of writing these books and, mm -hmm. and, and looking into papers. Um, and um, it was very odd, because I, I had no link to India that I was aware of, but immediately uh, fell for this place within a few weeks of arriving in, in Derudun to teach in a school in 1984. And really, I'm, I suppose I've been still on the longest year off in history. <laughs> it's a sort of <laughs> extended gap year that never ended. Uh, um, uh. But it's, it's, it's fascinating. You talk about these sort of entwined histories, so to speak. You know, uh, there are, there's Mughal heritage, there's Hindu heritage, there's English heritage. And a lot of these were themes in the, in the white Mughal. Um, and that sort of troubles a lot of assumptions on all sides of the debate, you know, whether it's nationalists there, nationalists here. How, how, how did you sort of navigate those worlds? Uh, and how did the book navigate those worlds? So you're right. I mean, the white moguls, is a story which doesn't fit into any sort of uh, accepted category. The idea that um, the colonialists of the East India Company, who were so busy asset stripping, looting, mm. and plundering the country, were also the ones who intermarried, mm. uh, was something which sort of had got lost in the historical wash. Um, but there's these extraordinary sources for them in the British Library, because two thirds of the company servants which went out to India never came back, they died. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result, the East India Company was continually involved in legal disputes with, um, with relatives who, who thought they should be re receiving large legacies that never arrived. Mm -hmm. And so they drew up a system whereby, from quite an early point in their history, wills had to be sent back to London and a copy kept in Leadenhall Street. And all these wills are now in the British Library. So you can read the, the private wills of every single servant that ever joined the East India Company, uh, from even if, they, even if they didn't die out there, mm -hmm. uh, from, the, I think, the 1770s. Mm -hmm. And the early ones, particularly the 1770s, 1780s, one in three record an Indian wife or uh, an Anglo-Indian child. And these are documents that would be seen by the family. So you know, one could extrapolate upwards from mm -hmm. that that there may be many that others who, who d didn't uh, record this. But it has its own, I mean, you know, racism, like everything else, has its own history, and, and it goes down very quickly. So from one in three in 1780, it's, it's one in four wills has an Indian companion by 1800, one in um, five wills by about 1810, and it's kind of more or less completely over by 1840. Mm -hmm. And the two peoples have moved apart. But in that period, in that brief period, you have exactly, in a sense, what you find so often today. You know, two people get together from different cultures and in different ways they make their accommodations. With, so in some households, everyone's wearing Indian clothes and, mm. and sitting Making on the sure, floor. Yes, yeah. In other households, every, you know, uh, Mughal Begums will dress in, in full Georgian finery and, and take on the, mm. uh, the way of the colonizers. Uh, and everything in between. Mm -hmm. uh, with all sorts of different, and, and not only do you have wills, you often have inventories of goods, and you find these, you know, nominal 18th century gentlemen with puckdans, spittoons, with beetle nut holders, with hookers, with, you know, the whole paraphernalia of, 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 of the material, the full material uh, uh, wherewithal of mogul gentlemen, but there's no mogul gentlemen in sight. These mm -hmm. are these are men from Cotswold or uh, mm. from <laughs> Sheriff Hutton <laughs> or something. <laughs> so, so what happens that sort of drives the two apart? Is it is it a policy of active segregation by the rulers? Is it is it something else? What, what, what's going on? I mean, what, because it looks like it yeah. would have been a very happy commingling. There is a very brief moment when it is extraordinary when you do have this this mm. mixture, but. Two things happen. One is, well, two or three things happen. First of all, the rise of sort of utilitarianism and evangelical Christianity, mm. and you get far more forceful missionary activity, which then is now mm. uh, upsets many people. Mm. And, and the, uh, the sort of restrictions now being put on uh, uh, missionaries mm. actually was put on by the East India Company mm. initially. Mm. And then the evangelicals, particularly a man called uh, Charles Grant, um, says, uh, who becomes a company director, removes the restrictions mm -hmm. on missionaries. And suddenly the missionaries are all over company stations. Mm -hmm. People are putting up the Ten Commandments in Urdu outside their collectorates. Uh, generals are reading the, the Ten Commandments or the Psalms to mm -hmm. Brahmin sepoys lined up on parade, <laughs> unable to run off. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and this creates a world where 
uh, rumours of mass conversion are mm. come to be believed because mm. there's enough evidence mm. of uh, religious zeal on behalf of the company mm. to mm. give substance to these rumours. So all that stuff about the, the, the grease cartridges and so on yeah. finds a ready audience and, 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 and plays directly into the, the uprising of 1857. And then I think simply it's a matter of power. The British, you know, you, if you are vulnerable mm -hmm. um, and unpowerful, you necessarily will have to have more respect for the people who can, uh, or, or at least be wary and, and cautious of the people who possess the power. In that case, you know, the moguls uh, mm -hmm. up to the, uh, when, when uh, Joshua Child in the, in the, I think, 1690s launches an attack on Aurangzeb's moguls, the East India Company is crushed in three weeks mm -hmm. and the fact is put in chains and paraded around uh, Agra and, and uh, uh, so on uh, and, and the company has to come on bended knee and beg for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. But by the 1780s there's been a military revolution, the Mughal Empire has broken down and the company can now begin to lord over the people it was supplicant mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get a huge change in attitudes mm -hmm. and this moment of Equality, when, when there is transfer in both directions, gives way. And it, it, it's a very brief moment. It lasts 40 sure. years. Yeah. But it's there, mm -hmm. and it's not in the history books. And it's a very different world mm -hmm. to the world we think of when we think of, of empire and we think of Curzon and, and viceroys and, mm -hmm. and so on. And it's quite an attractive period. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just happen in India. You get similar things going on, for example, in New Zealand with Maoris or mm -hmm. uh, with Native Americans in, in the New World. Um, but it's kind of over by the beginning of the 19th century and, yeah. and, and by the middle of the 19th century, it's totally dead. Yeah, yeah. fascinating. And, and of course, then th that leads you to sort of write about the last Mughal and the, you know, the, the collapse, which is, you, you know, very beautifully put in, 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 uh, in, you. in, in your work and also very poignant, you know, thinking about the last Mughal emperor who sort of, you know, considers himself at the center of the world, but except no one else does. Um, and, and what was what was that world like for 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 those who you know die, who were dying out? What was that sort of? Well, as you say, I mean, there are wonderful. I mean, the, the, one of the great sort of um, surprises working on all four of these books mm -hmm. with Bruce was that there was such a rich mm -hmm. literature from that class, the, the the mogul class who were suddenly finding themselves extra. You know, suddenly now they were basically. You know, that whole class existed on cavalry warfare. And when cavalry warfare became rather like, you know, we've seen how tank warfare in Ukraine in the last couple of months, that it seems that these new missiles can just open mm -hmm. cans, uh, open tanks like tin openers. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same way, the Mughal governing class with the new uh, infantry revolution of the 18th century were useless. You, you could, you know, you could do as many cavalry charges as you like, but when you, need, when you met an East India Company square, mm -hmm. Uh, armed with horse artillery and, and muskets, uh, you'd, be def you'd be blown to smithereens. And so this whole class found themselves without a job. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and one of the last things they could do was write their memoirs. So, mm -hmm. And there's all these extraordinary works, mm -hmm. very few of which have been translated into English, very f little of which has been studied before. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's where the translator's work, I guess, becomes so important because you can, you, you can extrapolate a lot from the bigger histories, the larger histories, but it's, you know, what's going on well, that the translators bring to life for the, you. I mean, what was so wonderful about Bruce was mm. that, I mean, normally, as, as, I suppose, you know, if, you, if, if you're not capable of reading the language yourself, and, and, and this is really complex stuff. Mm. It's, it's not an easy uh, script mm. to read, particularly if you have shorthand or, mm. uh, and in, and in non-printed sources, where it's actually with manuscript sources. Um, and Bruce would come and stay often for six months at a time. Uh, and, um, you know, we, he, he had a very strange method of working. He would live a very full life. He'd get up quite late. Um, he would appear at breakfast at sort of 11 o'clock and uh, um, in the, often in a kind of lungi or something and not much else. And, uh, and, he, and for breakfast, he'd leave like having fresh baguette, which he organised to be delivered from Khan Market, bon maman jam, a thick slab of butter, often an inch thick. And then he'd put on top of it lint 
90% dark chocolate. And this was something apparently his, his Belgian aunts had taught him to... to uh, uh, and, anyway, and this would sort of you know, give way to quite long lunches, but often very grand guests would turn up, strange sort of ex-presidents of Sri Lanka or uh, opera singers or curators at the British Library or British Museum or um, Orientalist scholars from uh, far parts. Uh, and then you take a siesta. <laughs> If and, then, and then, the and then there'd be, then yet, it'd be yeah. time for tea, which he would then sort of serve with this sort of baroque sort of, you, you know, a, this, he loved making sort of, you know, particularly delicate shortbreads and taught our, our lovely Bengali cook who, who makes very good sort of um, Bengali fish curries but didn't know what shortbread was until Bruce <laughs> turned up in the house. Um, and, with, you know, he, and some perfect petit four and things would suddenly emerge at tea time. And then, then there'd be gin and tonics. And, and, but then he'd get to work and he'd start work normally about six or seven in the evening or mm. possibly even later and would work all night. Um, uh, without a break, and, and um, rarely slept in a bed. He loved sort of snoozing in a chair or, or sitting in a... Uh, but with these very unusual hours, we produce often huge reams of work. Um, and, you know, occasionally you come back from a party and see Bruce typing away mm -hmm. downstairs by light. Mm -hmm. um, but he seemed to be someone who did no work at all because he never worked during the day. During the day, yes, yes. <laughs> But, but lots of stuff would turn up. And, and one of the things that you, you've written about Bruce earlier, and you sort of, you know, it, it's very obvious in the works, is, you know, he has this ability to, to convey not just the words of, of the writers, but also their worldviews. And, and I think, you know, the Afghan king, the Shah Shuja that you mentioned, you know, he, he, he writes about Shah Shuja thinking about what sort of person that king might be. Bruce's translations used to come with sort of enormously long footnotes. Mm. And there'd be, you know, there'd be sort of 10 lines of text, and then there'd be three pages of footnotes when he'd give his theory about why such and such had happened or what the sort of man. And, and again, these were things that, you know, I, I very um, actively used and even plagiarized. And he would have brilliant insights that, um, just brilliant, brilliant insights mm. and, into. Uh, uh, why such and such a thing had happened, and 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 his incredible understanding of that that world, um, and he had this strange sympathy with it. Mm -hmm. um, he, I think he, you know, he saw himself very much as as as, uh, as one of these sort of old mogul gentlemen um, mm -hmm. sitting with his guzzles and his, mm -hmm. and he produced these beautiful translations of their poetry, um, which again it'd be, it'd be lovely if we could translate them and I mean sort of publish them in some form or other. And, and I have to ask you this because you've sort of referred to this a bit already, but, uh, you know, what, what have you found um, to be, you know, the challenges of writing uh, around that period, which, you know, is so controversial on all sides of the, of the border, whether it's Indian, whether it's British, whether it's Pakistani in, in that sense? You know, what have been your sort of challenges? There? Well, in a sense, it's not the controversial period in the sense that, you know, if I was writing about Aurangzeb, Mm. It would land you in trouble with everyone because mm. here is someone who's a huge hero in Pakistan and is mm. a hate figure mm. in India. What was lovely was that this, we, we, Bruce and I had found together this little period of history, not little, I mean, a, a period of, uh, you know, 100 years, when very little work had been done on it. The late Mughal period is, is still one of the most underwritten Mm. Period and very pe few people know about it. And someone like Zafar is not a threatening figure, yeah. Um, yeah. To, uh, even to a, an RSS ideologue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's someone that clearly uh, uh, you know, negotiated both cultures, mm. um, took on uh, Hindu murids as well as, as Muslim ones. Mm. And th the work, I think, of those four books has re has really hasn't got me in trouble um, mm. with with even with this. Um, new dispensation who absolutely loathe the Mughals and, mm -hmm. and are actively writing them out of his, uh, history textbooks, uh, eradicating, discussing, eradicating their monuments and um, uh, rewriting textbooks to, uh, to, to demonize them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but this late Mughal period isn't, isn't in a sense what yeah. they're aiming their guns at. They're aiming it at Akbar, they're mm -hmm. aiming it at Aurangzeb and Mughal. Shah Jahan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and the same is true of, of um, I think, Indian academia. There's very few people working on this mm -hmm. period. So it isn't as if we've been treading into a territory which is hotly contested. Mm. And you know, if I'd been writing about partition or, oh, yes, or Gandhi sure. yes. or, you know, uh, there would be 700 other people 
who, who, who would know the period better, who would shoot and the thing one wrote full of holes. But it was very nice finding this period. That, um, there were a few people working on it, but very not many, and, and, and um, often very sympathetic people, because in a sense, the, what you're dealing with are history's losers. Uh, they're not the, you know, mm. the, there's, there's lots of stuff about in, in uh, the Indian press at the moment about uh, historians who glorify the Mughals, but in a sense, there's nothing to, to glorify about Zafar or Shah, 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 Shah Alam II. Or uh, these, these are these sort of tragic characters disowned, already orphaned by history. Um, uh, and so it, 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 it's, be, it's been, it hasn't been a, uh, a, a rocky ride from that point of view. Which you, I mean, many other scholars, you know, like Audrey Trushka and, yes, uh, and James Lang, uh, yeah. writing about uh, mm. the Marathas, have found themselves on the wrong side of the government. Mm. Um, but I, so far, haven't. <laughs> yeah, so far, yes. And which brings me to my last question, and then we'll have sort of invite uh, comments and questions from the audience. Uh, you've now been in India and South Asia more generally for about three decades or, or so. Um, in what ways have you found the region changed? Uh, you know, whether it's whichever way, you know, yeah. socially, in a, in a literary sense. Oh, I mean, sense. well, in some ways, and in some areas, there is little change. Uh, I mean, the, the things I loved in my first book about India, uh, City of Jinns, the Dargah, the Nizamuddin, mm -hmm. the calligraphers in the old city, um, a lot of continuities survive for all the change. But in other ways, you know, immeasurably different in terms of just sort of geography. The, you know, Delhi is now, mm. I think, four times the size, 26 million, mm -hmm. if you count yes. all the Noida Suburbs and, and, and yeah. uh, mm. uh, Gurgaon and uh, all the other bits on the side. Uh, second largest metropolis on Earth now, while it was, you know, barely one million probably when I arrived. Mm. Um, politically, obviously, a, a difficult period for. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, the, the current dispensation is both very popular and very right-wing. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, doesn't particularly warm to liberal scholars of any mm -hmm. sort, and I think mm -hmm. uh, academics of all stripes have found mm -hmm. difficult even getting visas. Mm -hmm. um, we run a literary festival that operates on a tightrope, uh, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it, it isn't easy now uh, in that world, and it's very sad. It's very sad. But it, I mean, but the government is very popular. It's democratically elected, and and there's nothing in a sense to be done. The opposition has, has crumbled. There is no opposition. So we, so one way or another, we have to live with it. Um, and no, it doesn't make my, it doesn't make me um, love things more. <laughs> sure, it's, it's, it's tricky. But you you've been able to pull off the Jaipur Literary Festival over the last. Two decades now, or is it ten years? Uh, it, uh, 2004. Okay, it so it's almost two, first, two yeah. decades. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it, that is a great pleasure. It has. I mean, mm. one of the other things that didn't happen much in India before uh, when I first arrived there was as you'd meet Indian authors at events like this. Mm. You'd meet them in in Hay on Wai. You'd meet mm. them in in Sydney at the mm. Sydney Writers' Festival. Mm. But there was no literary festival within India which mm. celebrated Indian writing. And I got together with two other people. Namata Gokhale, mm -hmm. who was very passionate about the other literatures of India in, in Hindi, Bengali, Marathi, mm -hmm. uh, and um, giving them a decent crack of the whip. And I think in our uh, last pre-pandemic festival in, in Jaipur, we had 24 different languages represented within wow. India. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, but we also teamed up with a wonderful man called Sanjoy Roy, who runs a production company called Teamwork, who has, is, is a kind of impresario of genius mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. totally unflappable, incredibly affable, runs a very happy ship of, of very young volunteers. Uh, and it's been an entirely pleasurable and, and it continues to multiply. I mean, somehow, uh, having started sort of just in, in Jaipur, we now have satellites all over America in Houston and mm -hmm. Toronto and mm -hmm. New York, mm -hmm. Boulder, Colorado, we had our first one in York last night. I woke up this morning uh, in York. Um, uh, sorry, in, in sorry, we had our first one last night in, Ro in Rome. Rome. Mm -hmm. I woke up this morning mm -hmm. in Italy. Uh, sorry, <laughs> we haven't yet invaded York. <laughs> it's coming, Sarah. It's, it's coming. coming, Sarah. So you be warned. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Sanjoy suddenly announces, you know, we're off. We're off to the Maldives next month, and off we go. It's, it's very nice. I have a few complaints. <laughs> Good, yeah. Who would complain with Maldives? <laughs> right. Um, on that cheery note, thanks, uh, William. Uh, I think we have time for uh, questions, comments, reflections from...
from audience members. So please, sir. I have a question about... Um, um, I think we have volunteers who will sort of bring the mic down to you so you don't have to struggle. Uh, I have a question about uh, Persian and Urdu. I was wondering um, about the interface between Persian, which was one of the languages, of course, Bruce was expert in. Um, I'm a Persianist too. I wonder whether, I'm Alan Williams, I was also in the, the book that we did um, for Bruce. Um, I wondered about the interface between Persian and the responsibility of the East India Company in the depersonization of, 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 of the country, um, or of, of, of the company, I should say, and, and its responsibility, as I believe, for the suppression of Persian and, so to speak, the, the rising of Urdu to take over. Um, it, did, it did end in, in well, it, uh, Persian was no longer the language of, of, of the company, so to speak, uh, after, after 1830, is that correct? 1832. Was the, 1832, was the date, yeah. yes. Yes, I mean, I think you're right. So, Persian was the diplomatic and court language of India from the early 13th century up until, uh, well, the East India Company stopped using it in 1832, uh, which was linked to the, the fact they also removed, uh, the, uh, the Mughal Emperor was on the stamp official stamp of the East India Company until that date. And so it was part of an active process of distancing themselves from their fealty to the Mughal Emperor, which they had acknowledged until that point, and then they just decided not to. Mm. Mm. But I think the rise of Urdu is a separate issue, um, because Urdu had risen... Um, Urdu started... I mean, it has, has older roots in, in Deccani and so on, but... It's only with, um, during the period of Shah Jahan and so on that it becomes the army language. And, and, uh, and so when you have different nations coming together, this is a kind of, uh, starts off as a, uh, and the word Urdu is, is the same as the English word horde, as in Mongol horde. Um, but it takes root in Delhi. Uh, uh, Ghalib describes it as a, uh, a, a child found wandering in the bazaars of Shah Jahanabad. Uh, and... Um, it becomes a Delhi language. So the, the rise of Urdu as a poetic and as a, as a literary language, I think, long predates the official abandonment of Persian by the company in 1832. Um, and the, the benefactor, of course, is not... Uh, after Persian ceases to be a, a diplomatic language, the beneficiary is English rather than Urdu. Um, so they are linked, but I think it's a, it's a, it's, I mean, it's a very interesting subject to study, and it's a complex story. Uh, but I don't think there's a direct. I think the, Ur, the rise of Urdu precedes and is a separate thing, because it's never. It's never Ur, Urdu. I think never becomes the official language of the East India Company or the Raj. Uh, it's it's English, which is then used, um, and so. Th the rise of Urdu has its own trajectory and its own history and its decline. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I, I would like to know also, uh, and I don't know you, our friend um, who uh, you're interviewing, William Dalrymple, your, what your name is, but... Indrajit. Sorry. My name, Indrajit. Yes. Indrajit. Indrajit. Yes. yes. Um, also, what your response to that question is. Thank you. Um, I'm not an expert on the Urdu-Persian <laughs> interface, but I would hazard that, uh, similar to what has been said, I think the rise of Urdu has quite separate uh, sort of uh, roots. And in the 19th, 20th centuries, it gets embroiled in what comes to be called the Hindi-Urdu controversy which directs it towards a totally different stance. And I think Persian gets completely marginalized in any conversations around language in India, because it is then, of course, seen as a court language of the Mughals, an external imposition, and no way in which anyone would like to have anything to do with Persian, neither the Hindus, of course, nor the Muslims, because they didn't want to be seen associated with what was 
a, a, diff, a language of another country. There's, there's that's also my a, a, limited. It, absolutely, yes. and there's also another sort of thing going on at the same time, which is the um, within the company the battle between the anglicizers and the of Sanskritists. Course. Yes. So you have people like my forebear James Princep, mm -hmm. um, who who and he and his brother Henry Toby Princep fight a big battle with Macaulay uh, in Calcutta Town Hall, mm. and they have public debates. This is a major issue at the time. Mm. And uh, they want to uh, teach it and work in Indian languages mm. and to um, appre uh, uh, have the East India Company cadets mm. uh, schooled as well as, uh, as uh, in, in these literatures, while the um, Macaulay Famously, he says, yes. that, you know, uh, a single shelf of a good English library is, uh, is worth more than the entire native literature of India and Arabia. Uh, uh, and, and so they, this stuff is publicly debated. Yeah. Uh, yes. and, and basically, Princep loses. The, yes. the, the, yes. uh, the Orientalists lose to the Anglicists. Yes, yes. And the fallout, of course, is, uh, like you say, you know, this, it, it's, it's, it's English and then everything else. And then Hindi and Urdu sort of are reduced to sideshows to what then is really English becoming the language of business, so to speak, across the, India. The good outcome of that, although, you know, so much is lost and there's massive mm. uh, dis uh, cultural destruction because of that decision, mm. but the good outcome is that, is, is that, that so many people in modern India speak English and can integrate into the wider business world mm. and, and therefore, you know, mm. Indian uh, soft software operators mm. and uh, back office mm. uh, stuff uh, can go on with mm. banks in America and Infosys can mend the mm. computers mm. of Goldman Sachs overnight or whatever, mm. you know, and that sort of thing is, opens up opportunities. And, and I guess it allows India itself to sort of somehow navigate its linguistic diversity yeah. as well. So rather than one language dominating others, everyone can sit comfortably disliking yeah. English, but living with it because <laughs> of all the reasons that you mentioned, exactly. yes, and having this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, uh, thoughts? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, just kind of picking up on what was said in the, um, in the answers to the last question about um, sort of, Englishness and and almost like otherness at times and in in the past and in, in em, empires and in, in India that that kind of idea of um, sort of reclaiming um, Indian history is has been quite a um, a big thing that may, that you've sort of done in your in your works and in your writing and um, I just wanted to ask about how you've maybe been able to navigate sort of resistance to that or how you've sort of... To resistance to what? Um, sort of resistance to your attempts, I guess, to really explore Indian history and, and, and looking at like diversities within it and just sort of how you've been able to sort of embark on that journey, really. Just as someone who's a real fan of your, of your works, just wanted to find Thank out you. more about that. So, I don't know, I mean, as I said, politically, I mean, I, I've fallen out with this government over different things, but, mm. but I don't think these books have, mm. um, have provoked any strong resistance from the Hindu right. Mm. Um, one of the things that um, I was very lucky with, in a sense, it, 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 there was a very odd thing going on in Indian history writing in the... 60s, 70s, and 80s, which was almost a cult of obscurity. Mm. Uh, and uh, movements such as the Subaltern Studies movement produced works excellently aimed at, um, uh, uh, at the underrepresented sections mm. of society, but also but, but produced in a very elite language mm. uh, of, of post colonial jargon that was, uh, you know, almost gatekeeping um, and was, would exclude most people that were interested in reading history. And the kind of book I was writing, narrative history, bi biographically driven with character, written in prose that you hope people would enjoy as, as much as they, uh, as they could, um, simply wasn't being written in India when I started in the, in, in the 90s. And there were a few people like Ram Guha, um, 
but most, th there was an extraordinary absence of biography, there was an absence of narrative history. And while you saw this on the price list, for example, so while there would be major Indian novelists winning the fiction prizes, such as the Booker, year after year after year, and, and Pakistani writers, and Sri Lankan writers, mm -hmm. the non-fiction prizes, such as the Samuel Johnson, uh, or, the, or now called the Bailey Gifford, or, the, or any of the big biography or history prizes, never had Indian authors on. And in fact, in the history of the Bailey Gifford, which is almost as long as that of the Booker, I think only Ram, Samant Subramaniam, uh, and um, this year, um, uh, a wonderful Bangladeshi writer writing on, on Islam in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, have ever been on the list. So you have a very different, uh, what, you know, India would be the world's leading first 11 in fiction, uh, but would be, you know, hovering with Afghanistan and, uh, uh, and, and, and Scotland for the, uh, on the, <laughs> on the non-fiction. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I, therefore, I was able to operate um, and sell books in a way that would be much more difficult if there'd been a whole generation of talented non-fiction writers. So I was very lucky in the sense that, I, that, that it, it was at that point, isn't it? Now, suddenly you're having many, many people like um, Manu Pillai and Ari Mukoti and, um, uh, and many others now writing this sort of book, but it, they weren't being written uh, when I arrived. So I, I had, on the other hand, it meant that people often didn't understand um, what I was doing, and mm. I, could, I, I, I got kind of more and more irritated and semi-murderous with reviews of the White Moogles that described it as a novel. Uh, when you spent five years working on the primary sources, <laughs> writing uh, a book with 200 pages of footnotes, that uh, uh, for it to be, uh, I mean, you know, but it was, and it was just not understanding. It was, you know, it was, if it was something that had a love story, it had to be a novel. It couldn't be true. Um, what was your? So, so, so there's some bafflement rather than resistance, I think. What was your? Be uh, favorite sort of review comment, if I may ask, uh, what favorite. really got you off? I mean, favorite in a negative, sarcastic sense. What really got <laughs> you off? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, some, some of the reviews of, of my early books, like City of Gins and White Moogles, were. Um, I, I mean, I, I got some pretty patronizing reviews mm. for, for for those elements. But the books have, have you know continued to sell and sell and sell and sell and sell. And I now sell many, many more copies in India than I do here. Yeah. Um, and Anarchy in particular was, a, was, was the best-selling non-fiction book that year and um, sold, I think, five times as many copies in India than it has yeah. in, in England. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you hear? Oh, that's oh, that's well, if the mic is yeah. getting. Oh. Thank you. Um, no, just you touched on all your ancestors, or whatever you call it, um, <laughs> forebears, <laughs> <laughs> who were who were all who were all in India as well. Have I missed something? Or have you not written? Have you written that story? <laughs> your your own family story. So if not, it'd be great, wouldn't it? They they all <laughs> they all come in and out of. Um, uh, of my books, there's, there's lots and lots of dimples in all those books, but I don't sort of go out to point their connection. Um, I mean, my the East India Company was was, in, was very specific in its in what it, the class it drew from. It never was of interest to the to the grand aristocracy, to the dukes and earls and so on, because two thirds of the people that went out never came back. So it was a very high risk strategy, but to people from my family, so, which is sort of minor squirearchy and, and, and sort of also vicar's sons from Northern Ireland, and, but people who were well connected but were not um, the, the top aristocracy, um, it, was, uh, it was a major way of, uh, of, of restore, if, you, if your social ambitions were greater than your economic, um, uh, the, the economic worth, you would send out the sons to India, and they might die, but if they didn't, you had a chance you might strike lucky on the great Indian jackpot. Uh, and the East India Company was, um, I mean, one of the important points to, to realize, the East India Company was a corporation that went out to India to enrich its servants. Mm -hmm. People joined it for the same reasons they joined Goldman Sachs or McKinsey's today. No one thinks it's gonna be much fun to, to, to 
to work for them. It's going to be very hard work. In this case, you might well die, particularly if you're in the East India Company Army, where I think the death rates were even higher. Uh, but if you did strike lucky and you did get to loot a city in the case of the army or get to uh, do some nefarious deals uh, in the case of the East India Company and assets trip othered or uh, put yourself in a position to receive massive bribes from a Nawab or something, you could come back uh, with a very, uh, 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 with a huge fortune in 10 or 15 years. And so many of the great houses of Yorkshire, of the Scots borders, of the Highlands, um, from this period of about 1750 to 1790 are either East India Company loot or Royal African Company and Caribbean slave trade. Mm -hmm. And we, something we all need to learn that when we see these gorgeous houses littering the countryside, so many of them from that period come from one of those two very dirty sources. Um, and when we, when we look at a gorgeous Palladian house, you know, it immediately you think of Colin Firth and, uh, <laughs> and lovely sort of Jane austen -y scenes and, uh, 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 and, and uh, Sunday night bonnet dramas on BBC. But the real, economic reality of those buildings... I gave a talk this time last week. I was speaking at Kirtlington Park outside Oxford in a festival called the Kite Festival. And I said this on stage... Uh, and I said, I'm not quite sure where the money for Kirtlington came from, but it probably was one or the other. It turned out to be both. Uh, it was the Dashwoods and some of the greatest Zophonies uh, of uh, uh, most gorgeous images of, uh, of 18th century British life in Calcutta are the Dashwood family and the Oriole family. And he painted them endlessly. They were very, uh, they were very uh, artistic. They played the harpsichord. They were, but they also uh, looted the hell out of Ovid. Uh, and uh, amassed a, a fortune hugely in excess of their business operations or their uh, company salary. And the result was cut into part. But there were cousins, also Dashwoods, who were in Barbados and were, you know, had massive slave money going in. So it is, it is something that we, you know, we, so often we like to romanticize in this country our uh, colonial past and, and you know all the way through the 80s jewel in the crown and all those merchant ivory films and lovely uh, images of similar lawns with maharajas playing croquet and uh, uh, elephants swishing their tails and beautiful ladies wafting over the bangalore club lawn and passage to india and all the rest of it um, and we don't wrestle with the central fact, which is that it was invading somebody else's country and extracting their wealth. And when the East India Company was founded, uh, I mean, the figure's hugely contested, but Angus Madison's figures are roughly that England had between 3 and 7% of the world's GDP uh, in 1600 when the East India Company was founded, and Mughal India had about 40% of the world's GDP. In 1947, when the Raj ends, those figures are more or less reversed. India's down to single figures, and Britain is, is, is well, not quite by 1947, the world's premier economy, because America is, mm. but it's still uh, the richest country in Europe. And, um, uh, and so much of that comes either from uh, money extracted from India or the slave trade. Um, we have three questions. I don't know how much time we have. Maybe we, can we take all three questions together? Well, and then I'm, I'm, to... I'm going nowhere else. I'm um, <laughs> just after a drink. <laughs> yeah, which, will, which is good stuff, I guess. Yes. Hi. So just building on what you were talking about then, it does seem that outside this room there is a very... Um, a general lack of understanding of what the British Empire was, how it contributes to the way the country is today. For example, with the Jubilee celebrations Brexit. and the talk of the Commonwealth. Yep. In my son's school, there was no acknowledgement of what the Commonwealth is or where it was founded. Um, I'm British also, by the way, so don't think that I'm <laughs> criticizing. Um, but I wonder, what do you think we can do about this? How can we bring this understanding to the wider public or hopefully back into the school curriculum? So education has to be the beginning of it. But even that's, as you know, heavily contested. There was a move to, uh, very recently, to have more t teaching of the empire. Uh, and my friend and colleague, Satnam Sanghera, was asked to put forward ideas. But that's been nixed by this government in the last two weeks. Uh, it's only, I mean, it's a crucial and massively important thing because 
what, sitting where I sit in India, you see hundreds of friends coming out from here and assuming that the Indians are our best friends and that they love us and they're thrilled with the Raj as we are. And it's all, and E.M. Forster's their favorite book and Kipling's a delicious read. And uh, of course, absolutely not true. <laughs> it's a, too much Neil Ferguson. <laughs> uh, but it's, so it is it, only by education, by getting it into the history curriculum, will, will, will this begin to change. And only then we'll be able to look at things like what stuff in our museums was acquired through war crimes and, 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 and massive injustice. And, and, you know, a whole lot of other things open up after that. But at this point, it, you know, it, it's just being reduced to, to culture wars. And, and the Tories see it as something that they can win that, that with the help of the Daily Mail and uh, a few YOYs on, uh, in, in the comment pages, uh, that uh, people will resist this as, as, as lefty, woke um, attacks on, on national heroes. So it has to be done carefully and sympathetically and in a balanced way. Um, if it's to get anywhere, uh, which isn't to say that as a historian you can't write the truth and, and put it out there, but in terms of um, winning the country over, it is a long march. I think it's changing. I mean, people are now beginning to be aware of this, and, and the fact that, the, that these culture wars have begun to break out and the battle lines are now established is at least a start in, in that. But it's uh, it, it's really important because you, it, I mean, in, and it's not just in India. You know, you see Brits going to Ireland just not knowing about the potato famine. You see Brits in Australia or Tasmania not knowing what's happened to the, uh, you know, ex extermination of uh, the Aboriginal peoples, and, and 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 it's it's the single biggest thing the Brits ever did, the British Empire. But it's not taught in any of our schools, mm -hmm. and it's a bizarre thing. You can learn about other empires. You can learn about the Roman Empire. You can learn, <laughs> learn about. <laughs> uh, uh, but you just don't learn about our empire. And, and, it, and it, it puts us at a massive disadvantage. And as you say, it, it reflects, is reflected in contemporary politics. So, you know, Brexit is related to this sensation that uh, uh, not understanding our place in the world and then or now. OK, we have two more questions here. Uh, do you want to just? Thank you. I don't have a question, but rather a comment. Uh, thank you so much for today. We've laughed, we've learned. It's very classic Bruce. Uh, I just wanted to say, I think it's a good thing that he worked that night because if he, worked, if he was up at the same time as you, I think you guys would talk all the time and not get any work done. <laughs> That's what I'm uh, So thank you so much for today. <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, is this, yeah, yes. it's working. I wanted to ask about Bruce too, uh, but it is a question. Uh, because of all the things I associate with Bruce, all his many talents, I wouldn't naturally put diplomacy in there. <laughs> and yet he was working in some of the most hair-raising political regimes in the world. H how did he not get shot? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question to end on, so yes, sir. Um, go for it. Well, I mean, he... he, he I think, I think he, he, ha he had some hairy moments. I think, you know, he didn't leave Iran of his own volition, I understand. Um, and when I met him in, a, in Islamabad, he'd had to leave Peshawar uh, because uh, he'd begun receiving what they call their night letters, uh, uh, which basically threats. Mm. Uh, and again, I'm not quite sure what the story was, whether it was him at work in the demi mode uh, uh, or other activities which Bruce would engage in, or, but, uh, I, but, you know, yeah, he, I think he had some pretty close calls, uh, and uh, particularly in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, the, it sounds nuts what he did in the, with, the, with the Mudge going in on his donkey. I mean, that could, any of that could have gone very, very... I mean, he did, looking at photographs, you know, he did look amazingly. He passed off very well with a beard and on a horseback with a turban uh, he, and with his perfect Persian. I mean, I, I met people in Herat who were just astonished at the perfection of his diary. He really could speak completely accentless uh, at diary and Farsi, both you know, modern Tehrani Farsi and uh, the, the old sort of courtly diary of Afghanistan, old fashioned. And he, accentless, perfect, idiomatic, uh, in a way that very, very few people do. But even so, 
Yeah, obviously, he, he was a Brit, and, and yeah, he wasn't an Afghan. And uh, any of those adventures could have gone very, very badly wrong. Um, but they never quite did. I don't think he ever, I mean, he, you say he was a diplomat, but he was enormously charming. And he could talk his way into any house or anything and, and then stay there for as long as he wanted, <laughs> and often for years at a time. <laughs> Do you speak from experience? <laughs> with, with great pleasure. My final, I mean, the final, my father died just before Bruce uh, got ill himself. And I remember going off to the funeral. We left, <laughs> we left a full, it was w winter in Delhi, which can get quite cold. So we left lots of wood in the, uh, in the, in the woodshed, quite a lot of wine in the wine cellar. Uh, not a wine cellar, just a couple of crates of wine in the, in the, in the basement, um, in the box room. And uh, uh, everything in quite good order. We came back a month later after my father's funeral. All the wood had gone, all the wine had gone, all the beer had gone. Uh, but at the terrace outside Bruce's uh, room had been transformed into what we called the Hanging Gardens of Bruce, uh, which <laughs> every charpoy, every sort of nice lamp, uh, every pot plant in the house had magically relocated uh, uh, up to this extraordinary sort of queue which had apparated on the roof of the house. And he'd had these fantastic... There'd been some, some Persian musicians he'd met and, and in, in Delhi, and, and he'd had a whole series of very wonderful parties. And people used to come up for months afterwards and congratulate me on the wonderful parties I threw, <laughs> which I had absolutely no knowledge of. <laughs> Well, I think <laughs> we should bring this evening <laughs> to a close. Thank, Thank you, you so yeah. much, uh, William. Thank I you for coming. Entertained <laughs> us, you've taught us. <laughs> Dare I say, you've thrown in a bit of decolonization <laughs> in there as well, in a very entertaining way. So thank you so much. Uh, I should say again that there is, uh, I think there are books outside, uh, uh, which uh, William is sort of happy to sign if, if you wanted him to sign soul books. So it's being sold by our independent Alan, um, I think they're Fox Allen books, so do go and have a look. Thank well, you. Thank you thank again. You. Thank you so much, and thanks to Sarah. <laughs>